If ever there was a phenomenon in life that I'm struck by, <laughs> is uh, it's trauma, and um, you know it's it's incredible to me how you know we experience these things uh, to some for some people more than others, right? Um, you know, to some extent, everyone has trauma. To some extent, I, I think we need to be fair and say that some people have a tremendous amount of trauma and other people less. Um, but that there are some consistent themes that the psychoanalysts actually had right which is that for many people, there's this, what the analysts would call a repetition compulsion, right? Somebody experiences something really terrible as a child. And then as an adult, there's, they find themselves seeking out similar types of situations. And it's just the most illogical thing one can imagine. And the analysts would say, well, this is a reparative wish, an attempt to throw oneself back subconsciously throw oneself back into these scenarios to get a different outcome. This repetition compulsion, making the same mistakes despite knowing better, right? Mm -hmm. And not necessarily from this um, standpoint of addiction where there are some deeper dopamine circuits driving that. Um, so, you know, trauma is fascinating in that way. I mean, what do we know about trauma? It's very clear that relief from trauma in some way or another almost always involves going deliberately bringing oneself back into the state of mind and body that occurred during the trauma. As horrible as that might seem, avoiding that seems to be an issue. And then gradually, or hopefully quickly, but in some cases gradually desensitizing oneself to that experience as not just a overwhelming, horrible experience, but a sad but no longer overwhelming experience so that they can gain some sort of um, ability to think inside of the, the memory mm -hmm. and to parse uh, and parse what happened. Oftentimes trauma involves a deep confusion for whatever reason, a deep confusion about who was responsible. And this is something that's somewhat complicated and um, can be troubling uh, to think about, but people will experience a, a trauma, a car crash, a, a sexual assault, a um, devastating financial loss can also be a, a trauma. And then somehow in the, in one's mind, it's not clear whether or not that was something that happened to them or that they created for themselves. Now, the typical script of this was people talking about, oh, you know, I shouldn't have been out that late or dressed that way or acted that way, but it actually can be much more subtle and diabolical than that. It can be that uh, it can start to route into people's own percept of self. Like maybe I'm not worthy of being happy and therefore the fact that this happened makes total sense. People create these, these crazy scripts mm -hmm. and crazy because they don't match any real world facts, but they, do match a lot of internal structure. And so it becomes very complex to, to unpack all this. But what we know for sure is that accessing the state of mind and body that resembles the state of mind and body during the trauma is the first step in moving trauma out of the body, so-called trauma release. Now, almost always that has to be done in concert with a really well-trained uh, physician or clinician because that can be overwhelming, right. certainly the first time. There's also some evidence based on some decent studies that show that accessing, deliberately accessing states of high autonomic arousal that are independent from the trauma. So things like ice baths, things like hard exercise, things like very, very intense experiences separate from the traumatic memory can be useful in allowing people to attain comfort at high levels of autonomic arousal, right? I mean, you're trying to essentially say, you know, go back to this place and work it through try and get some space or some distance from the emotion. And yet for some people, just an elevation in heart rate is overwhelming for them. And so they're not even going to set foot on the first step up the mountain when in fact, that's exactly what they need to do. I mean, we're all told to feel our feelings, but not trust them as facts. And yet here I'm telling you that most successful trauma therapies involve getting right up close to that event, really letting it almost overtake oneself and then start to create these, these gaps. And these gaps that I'm referring to are real gaps in neural circuitry. The, the work from Spiegel and many others has shown, and the work doing brain imaging under conditions of ketamine and other types of pharmacologic therapies have shown that there, there are active associations normally between the prefrontal cortex, which is thinking, planning, and reasoning, the insula, which is an area of the brain that monitors how we feel internally, and then some of these areas like the anterior cingulate cor uh, cortex, which are involved in kind of self-monitoring and figuring out how much of what I'm experiencing is coming from thoughts and things within and from things in my environment. Mm. And under conditions of extreme autonomic arousal and somewhat counterintuitively under conditions of deep relaxation, those neural circuits are able to rearrange themselves. And 
when one emerges from those treatments, the default network then is one of perspective. It's one of saying, ah, this is something that happened, but it was not my fault. There is no clear answer as to where trauma is represented in the nervous system. Many people talk about trauma being manifest as physical symptoms in their body. And that used to be considered kind of, you know, it's pseudoscience. It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. After all, the nervous system is the brain, the eyes, and the spinal cord for central nervous system. And then every organ in your body is innervated by nerve cells, mm -hmm. neurons, and the peripheral nervous system. So the manifestation of things in the body and in the brain is shouldn't surprise anybody. And